Uh, this is the first session of the uh, EDGE Symposium. This is our second one. Uh, this session goes till six. Uh, then we're gonna have a reception outside uh, as part of this and also a new student orientation out in the parking lot. And uh, then from seven to 10 will be the fiction and entertainment uh, session. Uh, tomorrow uh, from three to six, we will have design of cities. And then from seven to 10, we'll be reviewing the design theory and pedagogy students. And that's gonna be, uh, uh, should be interesting. We're having a kind of a dinner discussion format. Uh, so, uh, part of uh, the project here in postgraduate studies at SciArc is we're also looking for alternative formats of review, you know. So, uh, we're trying to uh, put a little more focus on the work and to have more general discussions. And uh, Marcelo will tell you a little bit more about uh, the format here. Uh, we're going to be sharing two sets of mics. So uh, after uh, the students present, uh, we're going to be, uh, ha I guess me and Marcelo will be in charge of moving the microphone around to each of you. Uh, we'll see how it goes. This is uh, uh, an experiment uh, as uh, is probably pretty much everything else in postgrad here. So uh, thanks for coming and I'm gonna give it over to Marcelo. Okay. Thank you, David, and thanks so much everyone for joining us. Uh, it's a long panel and you get introduced so you know uh, who everyone is. So, I'm uh, Marcelo Spina, I'm the coordinator of the Architectural Technologies postgrad program. I mean, we all wear many hats here at SciArc um, and so this is one of the things I, I get to do. Um, so, this is a one year long uh, postgrad program. The students are coming from all over the place. Uh, I mean, those of you who are here know the, a bit about the story, but, but for those of you coming from outside, especially those of you non-architects, it, it's an interesting situation because they come from many countries. In fact, I think we have one American maybe, and, and um, which is, talks about the kind of constituency. Yeah, well, you're not really American, but that's okay. Uh, I mean, that's something to be proud of, you know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, sorry. I don't want to get deported myself. And anyway, and they basically are here for one entire year, three terms. Uh, we call them semesters. They're more like you know, uh, uh, three and a half months or three months. And they work on a kind of sort of larger topic, but through project to project. So the the work you're going to see is actually the summer work, which is we call the kind of degree studio. It's the final studio, and one that I conduct uh, along with Casey Rim, who's seated uh, right over there, the tall guy. He'll, he'll stand up and explain you some things I cannot possibly explain. And so, I mean, the emphasis on technology, it, it's really kind of uh, far-reaching, and the, the specifics of, of, I guess, this year and the emphasis we actually started probably a few years ago had to do with the problem of automation, automation technology, and more specifically the problem of uh, sort of AI, you know, artificial intelligence. What does it mean for design? What does it mean for architecture? What does it mean in the context of making? What does it mean for fabrication? What does it mean to actually visualize? And what are the sort of implications eventually for the problem of experience, let's say? and which is kind of a bit of the, the, the topic of this particular studio, more as a provocation than the actual uh, specific content itself. And so the projects you'll see, seven projects actually, from individuals and groups, uh, sort of touch on, on many of these issues. Uh, ideally, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about this. Um, the site we chose to work on this, uh, on this uh, studio, it's actually the music center site, you know, right at the center of, uh, the kind of civic center of Los Angeles. We could discuss whether this is still the center or not in a city like Los Angeles that has many centers and, and it has sort of grow uh, suspicious about the sort of like uh, more institutionalized centers. So, um, I don't think the, the studio itself uh, aims too far to gain a kind of a, into the more sort of urban or, or a strategic thinking about what these conditions are, but they are definitely in the background. And I think it's important because, you know, because of the nature of our jury that, that you're sort of aware of that. And this is maybe a kind of long-standing project that might, might continue in following terms. So, uh, so let there be uh, that as a sort of basis. 
Um, I mean, again, given the condition of, uh, of AI, and this is maybe where, where Casey can, can be more specific, uh, and just so you're kind of not overwhelmed with like certain things, one of the things we wanted to do this, this semester is start with something that is it's kind of out there, let's say. It's like, usually as an architect, you before you do any project, you get a survey, let's say, and this is sort of a precondition for a project. Uh, now you have LiDAR technology, among many others, but that's actually one of the technology that allows you to scan a building and get a huge amount of information, including not only uh, points position in the building in, in, in space, but also conditions of texture, even color, and so on. Uh, so we started this project by actually literally scanning this building, uh, scanning parts of it, if anything, because it's, it's, it's way too large. Uh, that, you know, collecting a huge amount of data and then putting it on the students to see what, what exactly do you actually really do with that data and what does an architect, given the access to that data, could actually begin to think of what will change, let's say, from the sort of more uh, long-standing traditions of, of uh, you know, of what is survey mean, you know? So, so this is sort of the beginning of the, of the project and, of course, uh, then moves into a much more kind of a sort of wider implications that even go to the larger scale of a project to the scale of the material in, done in some cases. So um, before I introduce the jury, I'd like to pass it on to Casey maybe and, and to say a few things about maybe things they'll see that have to do with processes and things that are maybe, maybe too techy. And so <laughs> there it goes. Uh. I am Casey Reem. Uh, I've been teaching the studio with Marcelo uh, in an additional um, design uh, seminar with the students where we've been focusing on the use of artificial intelligence in design. Uh, the students over the course of the semester have looked at um, working with artificial intelligence in kind of two main areas. Um, as Marcelo said, using the LiDAR scanner, um, when we look at kind of the, the wealth of information on the internet of a given context or a site, like we, we're kind of living in an era where um, as, uh, an architect is confronted by, let's say, too much information so that it becomes um, overwhelming or can't actually be utilized. So the, the first part of the semester, we did a series of exercises looking at um, how you use things like uh, convolutional neural networks in an analytical phase, looking at classification, um, looking at ways that this, this kind of data can um, engage or change our perception uh, of a, an architectural context. Um, for example, I think some of the students will show uh, projects where they were using the Flickr um, similar search mechanism to find, let's say, non-architectural, historically correct uh, precedents for uh, the, build, the, the site they're working on, which is the, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion um, over here. Or it's the LA Con Music Center? Yeah. yeah. Convolutional um, neural networks are? Convolutional, so there, there's kind of two main types of artificial intelligence classifications the students will be working with. Uh, one uh, would be called kind of feed-forward AI. These are convolutional neural networks. It's typically what people mean when they say AI right now in the media. Um, this is a type of algorithm where rather than programming explicitly how it behaves, um, you create essentially a dense structure of interconnected uh, weights. And be like in the example of an image, if you explode the image into parts, it would start to connect all the different image parts together. Um, you show it maybe 10,000 pictures of a cat. It learns, it adjusts the scores in those weights. It learns what's important in that image that makes it a cat on its own. Um, so that when the next time you show it a photo, it can tell if something's a cat or not. So those are called kind of feed forward um, uh, AI. Um, and the students are using those both for classification, but also generatively um, to transform it, where they're using neural networks to both kind of analyze and input, but then the networks are also trained to then amplify or transform or mutate them towards some goal. Uh, the other type of networks that we'll see today are what are called GoFe, or good old-fashioned AI, and that's where the students are literally telling the intelligent software how to behave. So it's, it's a much more direct um, uh, application of their design intention into the software. We'll see a range of that and those applications. I think after the, that first couple of weeks of starting that, we were seeing the projects really diverge from looking at this tectonically, um, assembly-wise, interactively towards producing uh, game engines and, um, and with augmented reality also as part of it. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, this is, this, the projects are seen as provocations, speculations, you know, there are hardly any like a kind of completely developed architectural project like you will see in the kind of most kind of conventional studios, in, including in this school. And, and so, and, and students will sort of present them in their own way. So, um, let me introduce the jury. And it's a long panel, so sorry, I make my cheat notes because um, I don't want it to happen 
again, would happen at some point, which I forgot people that I knew. So um, and I read from here, and then I'll point to the person. So if you actually want to stand up so everyone sees you, sorry, this is a kind of public thing. And <laughs> we have uh, Johan Betum, um, who actually is visiting us from, uh, from Frankfurt, Germany. He's the professor of, architect is professor of architecture and the program director at the Stadelschule. I never can pronounce this right, in Frankfurt. This is, yeah, good enough for an Argentinian. Um, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Uh, and this Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. Uh, Mimi Seiger, uh, who's a critic, there he, she is, in red, balancing the black here. Uh, critic, writer, creator, and uh, instigator. I would have said that, but you said that of yourself. I thought it was actually ingenious, you know? Uh, most recently, the curator, uh, one of the co-curators of the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennial of Architecture. So, um, Ferda Colatan, another of our STEAM guest, um, professor, principal of uh, SU11 in New York, um, principal in architecture office, uh, professor at Penn Design, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Megan Steinman, who's here, uh, is the creator and the director of the Underground Museum in Los Angeles. Michael Young, uh, there, uh, principal of Young Ayata in New York, and assistant professor at Cooper Union. Um, David Ehrman, who's not here, uh, but still coming from the airport somewhere, who's the chair of the Graduate uh, Architecture and Urban Design Department at Pratt Institute. Uh, also Kimberly Meyer, who should be joining us soon, director of the University Art Museum in uh, Long Beach. Richard Koshalik, who's right on the, there. Um, this was a hard one, but I made this up. So uh, leader, cultural entrepreneur, I don't know how you like that, former director of MOCA, and uh, Hirshorn Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, Sam Teller, who's also not here, he's the director of the office of CEO at SpaceX, Tesla, and uh, Neuralink, and he's a member of our STEAM uh, board of directors. He's also not here. Uh, Lars Jan, uh, who's right here. Um, he's a uh, director and visual artist and founder of Early Morning Opera, currently working on an amazing project uh, entitled White Album. Uh, on John Didion's seminal essay, and happy to collaborate with him and his team. Jose Sanchez, um, principal of Pletora Projects and professor at USC. Joe Day, where is Joe? Okay. Joe Day, principal of Dig and Day Design in Los Angeles, design faculty and member uh, and member of the board of directors. Marcelin Gao, um, principal of Servo Los Angeles. Uh, and coordinator of design theory and uh, pedagogy and design faculty at SIRE. Marika Trotter, uh, faculty and coordinator of uh, history theory at SIRE. David Rue, of course, who you all met, our STEAM postgrad chair. And then Hernan Diaz Alonso, who should be joining us soon. Uh, short man with a beer, uh, for those of you who are visiting. Uh, <laughs> principal of Sephiroth Arch. Uh, and director and CEO of SIARC. Uh, so uh, with all that said, so a couple of things, and then we'll get started, uh, I promise you. Um, a, a bit about the format. So the, this is not a typical format. We'll see. I mean, we will kill it this year if it, works, uh, if it goes south. The students were asked to present in this very, what maybe we all might consider a little bit tedious TED Talk, just as a provocation to the sort of more academic jargon that we're all maybe a bit more accustomed to, to, to listen, and also to make them aware that they're presenting to uh, audience uh, made on not only of architects or, or connoisseurs. And so that was what we put in paper, that what we actually like pound, and uh, not to make any disclaimer now, but we'll see. And, but the idea is that they will present their seven projects, that should take uh, no more than an hour. After that, it will be a bit of an open mic session. We'll try, David and I will try to create it a little bit. Um, but it's not a conventional review, it means that what's done is done. So you can really take this anywhere, and then hopefully there'll be an interaction, and, and we'll see how it goes. You know, hopefully, I mean, we're not really going to arbitrate or intervene, so uh, it's all open. But thanks again for coming, and uh, yeah, we'll get started.
Thank you. Um, it's working. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ferial Farahzad, and my group mates, Leila Khodadad. What if the existing architectural elements can offer a new kind of information to architects, which can result in innovative approaches to design? How would this information and technology help us in this way is a subject that, that we have studied in this project. So in this proposal, we are experimenting with the propagation of data of the site of the Music Center of Los Angeles. The site has been captured through a LiDAR scanning process. As a result, we received super precise points in the space which contain highly dense details and colors information of existing structure. Uh, the aim is to propagate the data gathered from LiDAR scanning as a generative tool to create architectural volume and urban surfaces. In this algorithmic process, uh, the point cloud is resampled and moved based on structural based motion, which creates a series of high-resolution high modules. Uh, as you can see here, um, the modules um, the point cloud that we got through a LiDAR scanner has been uh, resampled and has been partially and carefully being curated and then going through the process that we talked about. So they are becoming, they're going through the stage of propagation and become, um, so they are extending outward and become denser and denser as they go through. This is another module that we chose from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And in this case, uh, the point cloud, the data has been going through the simple uh, operation of rotation and that also affect the process and create again going through the same stages of three uh, going denser and denser each time. And the color, as you can see, is coming from um, the color inherited from the inherited data from LiDAR scanner. So the fabric, the carpet, everything inside the Dorothy Chandler, even the lights have the effect. So all this information, we, we um, curate them and we, uh, we can see it in these modules. So then eventually these modules are being aggregated uh, through a top-down performative compositional decision and they are coming together uh, and these, uh, show, these scenes show how each module being resampled in specific location. Uh, these are a series of uh, modules that have been resampled through AI algorithm and selectively have been chosen based on aesthetic values. So this process shows the growth of information inside the, inside the theater and how they become material and become voxelized and become um, an architectural volume. And they can grow again and again so we kind of explore uh, how a designer create form of artificial intelligence uh, to amplify uh, their design intention in respect to complex information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hi everyone, my name is Janan al Sabah. And uh, my name is Motaz Abbas. Um, looking at those two projects, we, we were interested in the verticality of, uh, of the metropolis by um, Hugh Ferris in the left and the aggregation of the Habitat 67 in the right. Um, we, chose, we picked those images in particular because none of, the, um, none, none of the projects are shown in fully in the image. So that suggests uh, continuity in, in, in building and, and also designing how, how we can aggregate and, and, and keep building. Um, So from there, we, uh, we started thinking, how do we uh, design such a high-dense city that has sustainability? Uh, this is when we decided to produce modules that were completely different than each other, but also can interlock to create connections between the programs. Uh, we wanted to design something to give the occupants of the city a sense of differentiation. Uh, our definition of a mega city is when parts are combined, they produce different programmatic, aesthetic, relationships, and appropriate different urban design elements from the context of, into the modules. Using the modules as our building blocks, we were able to propose a diverse, dense, and accessible city with a variation in scale and verticality. Proposing the logic of joining between the object as an interlock system where the pieces fit together. Even if the parts assemble in a repetitive way, each assemblage of parts carry different details, reframing the urban aesthetics. Within each composition of parts, a different effect is produced, creating a variety in possible program use and accessibility. The complexity of elements and the ways in which they are configured denies any sense of monotonous repetition in relationship to the sites. The hyper-articulation within each part allows for numerous configuration without repeated assemblies. These modules enhance the performance of a mega micro city. This accumulation of different programs and aesthetic elements produce a more sustainable model for a cultural center in this type of plaza with large monumental buildings next to it. The use of repetitive parts work naturally in subdividing the city grid, creating a hyperdensification in the sprawling city of Los Angeles. The physical connection of parts converge in different ways to produce one continuous interlocking city. This model for the dense urban configuration of our city introduces a new scale of verticality. Our proposal will perform as, de as a dense city within a larger city, allowing it to operate and function as a hyper-dense and accessible metropolis. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Seng Tai Lintner, and I'd just like to thank you all for being here. So the genesis of digital signalization and its transmission has transformed the way that we live and interact. In aggregate, these telematic platforms construct our cultures. They construct our perception of the world. It's a world that, one might argue, um, that is shaped more by pixels on screen than by experience. 
But what if this contemporary condition could be addressed productively to create new formalisms, new meanings, and new interactions? Um, the project is a speculative urban tectonic that explores just that. It investigates possible interrelationships between the physical, so the solid and the corporeal, and the digital, which is ephemeral and intangible. And it does this through re-examining the hyperdense urban block through the lens of augmented and mixed reality environments. These environments are constructed through various sampling techniques. Um, so in this case, it's Google's reverse image search. And these outputs are kind of pixel averages of the Dorothy Chandler facade from the site. So on the scale of the urban block, the kind of flicker, flickering amorphous facade is the result of what Google thinks is a pixel average of international style. <laughs> on the scale of the individual inhabitant, the idea is that the architecture is somehow incomplete until it is digitally overlain through its occupancy. So here I've chosen to focus on the circulation areas. So each user is kind of surrounded by a cocoon of um, digital information and experience. And this personalized environment can be, it can be practical, as in the case of wayfinding, um, or it could you know, map circulation, traffic, other users in the space, uh, which is what you see here. It can reveal spaces that are normally invisible and create the illusion of depth or additional space. But perhaps more interestingly, it can create um, entirely new environments through a secondary architectural articulation. And the idea is that through this kind of shared digital usership, the architecture gets reclaimed and reshaped. Um, so while the facade was a kind of a result of those pixel averages from Google, the circulation articulation is the result of neural net style transfers, which is what Casey was talking about earlier. So what, I, what this is, is essentially using the neural net style transfer to construct the form of one image using the style of another. So here's the form of the physical architecture, and it's like, re, like reconstructed using the style of, in this case, the Baroque. And what's also worth mentioning is that the underlying physical architecture is made to be easily trackable for machine vision, so kind of like a QR code or a barcode. So it's the architectural equivalent of that. And in this case, it, this kind of object, it's used for object recognition for AR and feature recognition for AI. And the resulting environments are these kind of estranged, bastardized versions of historic architectural styles. And in aggregate, the idea is that you know, digi these digital physical environments enable data to begin to take on qualities that are more um, phenomenological rather than informative, which is what we normally associate with data. So it's an architecture of spectacle um, activated through the collective occupation of its inhabitants. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jin Su. Hello, I'm Mahdi. Yeah. Technologies such as AR, VR have shown us uh, new modes of representation. The, these technologies are changing the boundaries between the, the virtual and the physical reality. However, uh, in the area of the architecture, the, where the physical aspects is emphasized, these technologies have not found their roles. So what happens, the, the architecture becomes an active playground for the, the virtual experience, not a mere the, uh, physical space. Basically, we focused on developing the AR software. Uh, people can use our uh, software, and then they can draw what they want to see more about the performance and the stage and uh, actors and so on. So, 
what we propose through our software is not just a listing of information, but the proposal for the, the future performance that will enrich it, the performance by incorporating the people's way of thinking. So in this software, users are provided with set of modeling tools that can be used to quickly add extensions and expansions to the existing buildings. Once users add their uh, extensions and expansions, they can start to put their media on the site. And our software supports uh, different type of media. Uh, it supports images, uh, videos, uh, holograms. So using our software, we added, uh, added structural extensions to the Dorothy Chandler. And we wanted these structural uh, extensions to be in correlation with the existing uh, building. Uh, you can look at this uh, project as a small town with uh, narrow uh, alleys, with uh, urban squares, with uh, places of gatherings. The way we look at the performative space is that architecture becomes one aspect of performance. So our project creates sets of fragments that affects not only the architecture, but also the urban landscape. Uh, the relationship between the tradition, traditional structure of the audience and the stage becomes less clear as all the spaces become changing to become the stage. So the facade of the building is giving us hints about the performances to evoke a sense of curiosity of people. And once uh, people are inside, uh, they will uh, experience uh, the full uh, performance. Also, we were trying to uh, create, establish dialogue between these media pieces and these uh, structural uh, extensions. And uh, this is a type of experience that you need to uh, walk around, m move around to discover, to explore in order to get the full, uh, in, in order to get the full picture of the exhibition. So people can enjoy the space by combining the physical uh, parts uh, with the AR by using our software. And this can be a way to afford the people to use the architecture more actively. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm, Michael, I'm Marcos Dana. Thanks for coming. I would, I would like to start by placing a few questions, for which, unfortunately, I have no final, but rather tentative and provisional answers. What AI can do for us as designers? Or in other words, how can, AI, how can we use AI as a tool along the design process? Can AI transform notions of style? And therefore, could there be such a thing as machine creativity? So what I'm going uh, to show you could be simply described as a process to adding architectural intelligence using machine learning so as to create increasingly complex, performative, and resi resilient projects that are still able to incorporate issues associated with history, typology, material, and assembly. Trying to answer some of these questions, and instead of starting the project by facing a black canvas, I began the exercise taking a different approach to the site survey. So I took a bunch of images of the site, and I sorted them into different categories. After doing this, and by using AI on a more, let's say, a speculative level, I tried to figure out what relations could be made working with neural networks. In this example, uh, using uh, Searchwood, two different buildings that could be found on the web. As a result, and answering to one of my inquiries, I found that AI doesn't really care about the historical significance of the building, neither the stylistic significance of their parts. Instead, it's purely looking uh, at geometric relationships. So as a consequence, columns that ubiquitously appear on the site get a strong presence on, on the results from the search, giving us pictures of hypostyle, mosques, uh, temples, among others. So from this search, I took these images that Google and Flickr thought that were more related with the site. So yes, this time it's not only Google fault. Uh, and, I, and 
I use uh, a convolutional neural network to train a model by crossing these pictures with images of the existing conditions of the site. From this process, I got a bunch of 2D images, but with some free qualities, let's say, and potentialities embedded on them that I amplify later into a 3D model, adding architectural elements like columns, floor plates, or, and rooms in those areas where the 2D images suggested uh, that. So in a way, machine anticipated the three dimensionalities and I interpreted them. For doing this, and instead of doing just a high field or using some techniques that allow taking information, reducing it intelligence by removing color or data, and then combining it through abstraction like triple destruction or high field, like the one that I'm showing here, uh, I took an innovative path using machines and coevolutional neural networks for reintroducing more intelligence back into the system. At the same time, and to add more depth to the model, I split the images into consecutive layers using color data and point clouds, and I interpolated those layers, adding more information in between. Furthermore, for the process of surface reconstruction, I assign a different geometry to each point presented on each layer, depending on their position and the degree of fidelity that I wanted to keep with the original 2D images. So it wasn't just about uh, extraction, but about increasing the intelligence of the data that has been moved from 2D images to a 3D model. At last, but not least, I decided to take a step forward into this process. And again, I use a CNN trying to add more complexity to the project. So I created a bunch of plants extracted from the 3D model, the one on your left. Uh, and I trained those plants with plants of hypostyle, mosques, and temples, just to be consistent. <laughs> in this particular case, by doing a kind of plant analysis, machines didn't really care about the historical significance uh, of a column or a wall. Again, machines were purely looking at geometric relationships. As a result, these new plants are producing a kind of in-between condition where columns, walls, or piers are not really working as they were supposed to. As a, uh, as a consequence, this new model were produced out of different typologies of what we can call neurological parts. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eddie. So the ethos of my proposal is to use AI data as a design and assembly workflow to create physical objects with interest in the translucent. Discussion is centered on existing co construction forms and how these merge together to create new prospects. Basically, translate data into fabrication. I wanted to experiment with transparency, assembly, how this manifests in the building process, which could be seen by the public how this renewed abstraction could materialize into a tangible segment design from different methods of fabrication which in turn will turn into one object or a series of them. So this was a two-part process that I had to do in order to get an output. The first being how I translated raw AI data into something more, more of use for me. So I started with a neural net exercise. I searched for a catalog of performing art interiors and which the AI would learn to recognize and then superpose them on top of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, an existing performing arts center that was on our site. This produced a series of new weird imagery. These images were all grayscale and low quality. They had horizontal striations and also had a perspective conditions, such as background and foreground parts. Parts with more noise and resolution and parts with none. There's also a sense of scale. This data had, had form for sure. So these are just a few of the many that, that it produced and that you all take on to a physical form. So in turn, I started to change the images here I would flatten the image and highlight the pixelation. I took away the perspective conditions it had originally just to see how, how this could follow into something else. I then used extrusion and created a 3D digital piece. Now it has depth again, even though it's not spatially like it was before originally. I started also to play with line drawing. Each iteration has some parts which were done a bit different, whether it had two different face profiles or had an engraved pattern process added into the the making it. I started to play with light and how it affected the objects and its translucency. And I started to analyze if the original image 
could be legible on the piece, also hinting that this could be part of some large modular pieces of a building. The thought process to making these objects was to go back into 2D imagery. So I deconstructed the images by treating them as white pixel bricks assembly, and the darker areas became the tool pattern for casting and milling. I also made sure to include a modular profile so they could fit into each other. I choose these methods since they're not common related to this sort of material process. To add another layer, I also engraved the original neural net image on a translucent sheet and draped it on top of the piece just to add an extra layer to see if I could bring back the original image and add another part of the assembly. And then to bring this to human scale, I just started to make, portray a couple drawings to see the relationship between human and building. And then we here will come up with a scenario of an existing facade building, the Dorothy Chandler. I believe there's a lot of research still needed to be explored on a neural net materialization and how it can affect real world design. I believe it's a process that can open up many other discussions and give us a new perspective. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As you might have fi figured out by now with our musical chair experiment, I'm the last one to present. Um, my name is Maxim also. Um, so, whoops, give me one second. Okay. Um, I'm going to start this presentation by quoting a passage from uh, the fifth book of Vitruvius, and it reads uh, like this. When there are to be changes in the play, or when the gods appear with sudden thunders, they are to turn and change the kind of subject presented to the audience. Um, so what Vitruvius refers to in this passage is a theater device called the Periakoi, and the Periakoi demonstrates that the architect's obsessions uh, over creating depths and faking depths and visual illusions uh, through the use of imagery and graphic devices was important in the art of theater design. So from Greek theaters, which these Periakoi supposedly uh, date back from, to Roman theaters like Palladio's Teatro Olimpico, to now fully immersive uh, VR domes, the projection of an audience into a spatial illusions um, still intrigues the architect's uh, work today. And recently, um, recent advancements in neural networks um, algorithms, like we've seen in class, offer a new window into pursuing this project of the Periat Koi, uh, which basically ally image and motion uh, for theater design. So Vitruvius, uh, Periacor were simple uh, triangular prisms, hand-painted and mechanically operated to turn to present an audience with different scenes. But now robotics offer a more kind of robust and elaborate uh, apparatus for choreographies of motion, transition, and even uh, projection mapping. Uh, so rather than painting, hand-painting each faces of the Periacoib, uh, the process that I'm using and the panels that I'm using use neural networks algorithm for their ability to track, uh, recognize feature and therefore tracks elements in motion like the panels and also for the intriguing image qualities which I'm going to talk about. So basically the uh, armature for stage design that I'm proposing uh, develops and utilizes a, an AI model which collects, samples, and reimagines stage imagery while also uh, tracking and mapping a panel system in motion. Re-examining one of the major kind of principle of current image culture, which we've discussed at length in class, that of the quorum, the reinvented Periat Koi uh, achieve visual trickery through this unbiased ability uh, unbiased ability to blend form and style, say the panels and uh, Rococo or Gothic. So rather than being literal reflections of a style, they more subtly allude to stylistic elements and uh, composition, which in my opinion better aligns with the craft of theater fiction. 
to then uh, remap these imagery onto, uh, back onto the armature, uh, we use projection mapping techniques uh, that are able to then collapse image and motion into kind of like a seamless process. Uh, what I'm showing today is but a prototype um, of a panel system that could then be applied, let's say, in other uh, in-situ theaters uh, outside of the robot house. Taken as a whole, uh, the new armature for stage design that I'm proposing um, kind of presents a nice spin on the Senai Franz, which for those of you who don't know what that is, it's the heavily articulated architectural background of a Roman theater. Uh, this perhaps not being as uh, permanent, it also uh, is just as heavily decorated and also it achieves at, um, it is successful at improving the Periakoi device that I presented at the beginning by successfully using AI imaging techniques to map and track panels in motion. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you guys, this was awesome. I don't know if it's like a TED style, but that's a different thing. Um, how are you guys feeling? Do you need like a five minute break to mingle and then we'll launch or we can launch? Five minute break, launch. Okay, so uh, open mic, so I knew this would tough, you know? Megan, okay. All right, why don't you do it and then I'll pass the next one. Hey, thanks so much, you guys. Those are super fascinating. I, I couldn't help but think if, um, about this relationship. Maybe it's a reverse perspective of um, augmented reality and hallucinations. And I wonder if there was uh, any discussion of that in the class or if you were thinking about that in terms of, um, you know, the fact that there probably is a lot in the world, in the cosmos and whatnot, that we don't see ever, right? And that in many ways, creating architecture is a way to give us proof or some security, right? That, um, that what we experience in our everyday is real. Um, and that there are obviously from religion to theater to, um, you know, many, many practices uh, are looking at, you know, uh, how to, uh, discuss everything that we cannot see, right? And I wonder if you have any thoughts of that in relationship to this, you know, deep dive that you've all done into um, an attempt, you know, to map out spaces that don't exist and to create spaces that in, in many ways from an engineering perspective cannot exist, right? And, and to in, how to um, think through how we might inhabit those. Um, anyway, so it just, I guess the, the main relationship between this idea of hallucination, uh, which I think maybe has some kind of taboo to it, and augmented reality, which by the very nature of the word reality has um, maybe a little bit more validity or created validity. So, thoughts? Um, you are there. <laughs> Well, I think that was a, yeah, that was, a, thank you for that comment. Um, I mean, I guess I would argue that it's just a different form of reality. So, I mean, a lot of digital information, that's like, as you say, it's stuff you don't see. So I thought, I mean, at least in my project, like exploring that information that you don't see and actually making it visible was, an, like, that was an interesting exploration for me. Because we, I mean, a lot of the world and our media is just, you know, it's like, it's stuff that you see on the screen, but just to like bring it out into the world, I thought was an interesting uh, take on it. Um. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I very much enjoyed it, so thank you. Thank you to all of you. But there were, I think there are also um, a very wide range of projects. And uh, so it's difficult to address um, a topic in general. However, it seems to me also that 
when using technology, there is um, there is the asking of what that technology can do that other processes that we know cannot do. And I think some some of the work is more successful at at that than others. And I think that links in part to what I would call or what I would refer to as a tangible uh, problem. So when you work with some something that becomes say becomes tangible topically or thematically in architecture, um, it actually, um, I think the, the work excels. Moreover, to me, that has very much to do with a, a question of scale. And I pick up on what um, your project, in fact, which uh, very much impressed me, um, because it becomes tangible the moment you, well, I think you, not falsely, but I think you, uh, more or less wrongly distinguish between the digital and experience at one point in your presentation, although I don't think the work does that. I think the work excels very specifically um, because you have, um, you basically land, the, uh, you anchor the, your use of technology, your engagement with technology with respect to um, what I would call a tangible problem or a tangible um, a set of experiences in relationship to architecture. Mm -hmm. That in particular exemplified by when you speak about wayfinding mm -hmm. and yeah. when you very, sp very concretely actually show that by engaging with uh, technology and AI, you're actually able to produ produce or generate a series of alternate experiences, visually speaking, which most likely would translate um, to the previous comment is, um, referred to hallucinations. I don't think they, they would be. I mean, I think that the, uh, whether that would be in terms of augmented reality or in terms of a virtual reality experience, um, I think they um, must be understood as absolutely real. Uh, real in terms of human experience. And it's a, to me, it's a question of scale because very many of the projects, they actually deal with things on the scale where it's, to me, a little bit difficult to see how the engagement of technology actually produces a, a, something different than what we could otherwise do. Um, tangible also was your project, I think, very much so. Um, I think it would, the implications of it go far beyond the theater in itself, but I think that by the time you anchor it in terms of theater and the staging, I think of the uh, theater in, 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 in English Renaissance and mnemotic te techniques, ways of actually um, experiencing and attaching forms of uh, um, memory, experience or re-experience to the visual. I think it becomes extremely powerful. But also, in fact, some of the images, when you take it all the way into um, the coloring stage, begins to also produce a, a set of, um, to me, a set of novel um, type of, you would refer to them as panels, but um, visual instances. But these are the two crucial points, um, one being about scale. So actually understanding that the technology is most powerful the moment it actually uh, begins to produce something on a, um, a scale that we could connect to human experience. That, that is one thing. Um, and the other one is the, the question of a tangible problem, which um, again, I would connect to, the, uh, to, to my first point about scale. But thank you so much. Was that, was that a question or should we? Yeah. Sure, okay. <laughs> I'll just jump in. I probably also have more comment than a question. Um, I think some really am amazing work. Congratulations oh, to all of you. you. Um, I really think it's quite evocative. Um, and I agree with Johan, there's so many different kinds of projects within the meta project that um, all of you endeavor here. I think um, I'd like to sort of just um, observe um, what I thought was interesting in the development of, <clears throat> let's say, the earlier digital project of the 90s and the way how we were looking at technology and then sort of how this project is different in the way how it looks to technology because in a number of cases you made a kind of disciplinary argument, you know, you brought in elements of history, parts, you know, a lot of references to other styles, etc. But nobody really made um, a comment to the most recent history of the digital, which I thought was interesting. Um, but so I may do that instead. And I think um, what what appears to be the case is when we were 20 years ago asking what the new technologies can do for us, the question was how um, they could design in a sort of generative way, right? How could it be sort of um, 
taking away the top-down thinking of the designer and bringing in a machine that kind of does at least part of it, and therefore there's novelty in the things that are being generated through digital. It seems the interest here is quite different in the way that your projects are asking primarily the question of what does technology see, right, rather than what does it make? Um, and then the second question is, once I see what technology sees, what will I do with it as a designer? Would that be fair? Right. So, and I think it's a perfect um, metaphor for the time we find ourselves in, because in, in one way it's really idiosyncratic. Right? It's a really idiosyncratic approach to say, um, to sort of project a vision into the machine that we have built in order to sort of own it back and then turn it into some kind of an architectural proposal. Um, and I'm fascinated by it. I think it is idiosyncratic and strange in so many ways, but it's also really quite beautiful. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing a range of projects in some cases where, uh, let's see, the architectural, the, the way how we conventionally understand it kind of creeps back in rather clear terms but it seems to work now as a glitch for the technological rather than the other way around, which is also, I think, interesting because 20 years ago, it was the other way around, right? We're trying to glitch through technology and now it seems the quote unquote real within our disciplinary comes back to glitch the technological. Anyway, um, fascinating work. To quote the hive mind of the internet, <laughs> We, the feature may not yet be a bug, but the bug is already a feature. Uh, no, I wouldn't, so, so, so guys, it's been a pleasure to see this a couple of different times over the course of the semester, and I wanna make a couple comments because I think one of the main things that this kind of work puts on the table for me, um, which has been alluded to actually in you know, some contrasting ways by other members of our jury, um, is whether or not we're producing new forms of vision or whether or not we're producing new forms of, um, uh, uh, stuff and what is the connection between those two things? Can you do both at the same time? W what needs to come first? Um, can they both happen simultaneously, et cetera? And here, I want to point out that to me, architecture has always been, and I'm saying this as like a proper, let me just put on my proper architectural historian hat for a minute. Architecture has always been about a way of seeing the world and a way of positioning ourselves in it. And I would argue that actually, uh, unless it can somehow uh, um, make sense simultaneously, and maybe we're entering that moment now, you have to have the vision, you have to have, as Megan put it, the hallucination before you can have uh, the tangible, I would say. And I think one of the, the things that I'm always a little bit struck by as a kind of a, um, maybe a glitchy idiosyncrasy of where we are now with this stuff, is that when you get into the tangible imaginations of how the heck you would do this, there's this kind of unreal and almost unethical density of materiality that starts to position itself. Like, as if every pixel, in order to be given its due, has to be extruded and densified into some kind of matter. I would say for me, the more successful projects here where you guys have landed are those that are willing to uh, uh, throw out in a speculative and maybe hallucinatory way um, what we might be looking at without a huge amount of commitment to any literal transcription from the space of the pixel, which is very, very small, and the scale of the pixel, which is very, very small, to the scale of the architectural building block. And I would question, actually, whether or not we need to pay homage as architects in a kind of dense accumulation of matter that, again, seems to border on the irresponsible to me, um, to these new ways of seeing, or whether or not we can simply register those in more architectural ways with a little bit sort of more economy, with a little bit more simplicity, with a little less one-to-one -one fidelity. So how do you get the complexity? How do you deal with the data? How do you deal with the overwhelming um, mass of stuff that's available to you without literally simply transcribing it or transposing it or registering it into a giant accumulation of density? And I think that's, the, you know, in the discussion of the discrete, in the discussion of the, the work that, that is on the table here and the highly speculative and often very beautiful and very evocative work, to me, the, the responsibility of the architect 
um, it still needs to be resolved. Thank you. I, I had a comment, but now I'm thinking different things. Uh, <laughs> no, but I'm super interested that you brought up this question of it being unethical. Because uh, at some level, to give every pixel its due seems to harken back to a world in which one would express a truth to material, a truth to construction, a truth to tectonic, a truth to, you know, be true to your site, to your context, to your program, be true to your school. All of these things seem to be where aesthetics becomes secondary to the ethics of an expression. So maybe at a certain level, if every pixel gets its due, it's too ethical. Do, do, So, that, would that be a digital populism? A digital populism. <laughs> so maybe maybe that's another way to say it, other than ethics. I don't know. It it might be because the unethical image maker or architect would be the one that conceals everything beneath a smooth masquerade of some sort of uh, hallucination, and the ethical architect would be the one that is somehow there to reveal the underlying essences that are operating beneath. And what I find to be the most interesting, or the most successful moments here, and there's good things in all of them, so don't take this the wrong way, uh, is how come we're back into the bas relief? And I mean this as a very deeply embedded aesthetic question that many of the projects are operating, I mean, some with a Yours specifically with the Baroque bas relief, others the stage screen. There was one that was also, I mean, many of them, as kind of one of the heart of the questions where one started to propose the physicality or the questioning between tac tactile and optical relationships to the ornamentation and decoration of the world, and in that producing something ambiguously between what is real and what is not real shifting us into, you know, one could say, the discourse on aesthetics that we've been dealing with since the end of the 19th century. And um, maybe to position a comment and somewhere in between those two, it's not trying to balance them out, it's just sort of a yet another kind of piece of the puzzle. Um, I found this really fascinating to watch. I've recently been writing an article about the use of AI in landscape architecture. Um, and within that is my question is, has to do with the data sets that are at play here. And, and I wonder if this idea that we are drawing data sets from LIDAR, which is giving us a visual a set of data based on visuality scanning. Um, and then also sort of the other end, I think, of data sets that we were seeing was the um, uh, Google image search or reverse image search. Like we have these two sets of data. Um, when I talk to the landscape architects about AI, um, they have a whole different set of data sets that they're bringing into the equation here. And, and I wonder if, um, you know, so they're looking at sort of like, urban flows over time, like they're bringing sort of big, huge, take 10,000 year time, sort of, they look at sort of both the micro and the macro. And I wonder, you know, what data sets are we missing um, in this kind of process um, that may produce, I, th I think the kind of twin, the twinning of the two data sets are producing a certain kind of aesthetic. Um, it's kind of, it's sort of drawn from how we've been teaching it, these things to see. Um, if we introduce a different kind of sort, which is what AI is really good at, it's right, it's just a sorting machine at its dumbest. Um, you know, can, can we produce yet a sort of a, a, something that we don't know yet? Um, and, and so I think there's something very exciting when I heard the brief originally, which was like LIDAR to AI to AR, like, I think that's really quite an exciting prospect. Um, but, I, but I also feel like we haven't covered yet in this group of projects sort of all the possibilities or like even a sort of a fraction of the possibilities of the kinds of data that we could be inputting in like real urban data, like real hard sets of stuff that it's open source that you could be plugging in here to make all sorts of really sort of wild things happen. Um, and, and yet I'm not kind of there yet. But, but sort of it's a really quite interesting place to start. 
Well, I think to, uh, touching on the, the issue of the training, because that comes up again and again when you guys talk about this work, and I, I, I would echo the sentiments of the others. I think um, really impressive range of things we've seen, and I agree some are more successful than others for various reasons. Um, but I am fascinated by the connection between this idea of training, connorship, and aesthetics, and how, so the criteria that you use in this sort of training process, um, the issue of resolution, that I think on one of the previous reviews we were talking about the connection between uh, resolution and duration, which I think is fascinating, that that's sort of a new connection that's coming up here just in terms of the workflow. But then I would ask, so what are, you know, what are the proclivities of this maybe emergent aesthetic that's coming out of this? I mean, how do we, uh, if you're setting the criteria for training, or sometimes you're relinquishing that role, you're saying, I'm not setting that criteria, but then what's coming out, how are you beginning to evaluate that? Can one of you speak to that maybe, perhaps? I'd love to hear somebody take a stand on that. Because, I, you know, again, that the sort of TED Talk thing, I think you guys did a, a great presentation. And there were certain assumptions, like I think saying you said something about the nature of um, the digital being really ephemeral. And, and I think that could be debated. We could say, okay, is it so ephemeral? I mean, that's the assumption we all have. This yeah. is invisible. It's particulate. Um, but also, I think, linking back to some of the comments uh, of, of Michael and Ferda, the, you know, when we think of a more recent um, digital history where we were working also with things like uh, particle dynamics and point clouds, and they were always kind of elusive, and it was sort of how can we uh, bring these into architecture? And so in a way, I know these point clouds are operating differently, but I don't know, I'm just curious how, there seems to be a sort of uh, a neutrality. I'd love for somebody to take a stand on. Or is this, is this aesthetic at all? Or are we beyond, there is, is this stuff, is there an aesthetic that comes out of this? I mean, the, sorry. I, I mean, a lot of the aesthetic is still choice, right? Like we're still choosing what data sets to put into it, into, into the neural networks. So like in a way, yes, the process is kind of automated, but the training, like the, the, what, what, the act, what you're using to input into training or what you're training it on, there's still an, auth like that's where you gain authorship and that's where, the, like, that's where you choose what kind of aesthetics uh, you want to use. But I just also want to make a comment. I think the use, the, when you use neural nets, it itself has its own aesthetic. It has, I mean, when you see these images, you recognize them as neural net images. Like, yeah, maybe. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you fleshed out your your point about the, these two potential directions for the data sets mm -hmm. and how they do have different consequences for that question, mm -hmm. and the idea that, you know, frankly, if it's an editorial question of of image-based data sets, the aesthetics are to a certain degree how you cook what you're looking at, and then on the other hand, if you're looking at spatial, ma you know, digital uh, data sets of spatial mapping, your way of your way of making sense of that ambient, of those amb that ambient pixelization is very different. But I, I want to take you up, Ms. Lindner, I believe, <laughs> on uh, on a on a turn of phrase that you used in the middle of yours that I think is really important. You you moved from pixelization to signalization, mm -hmm. and I actually think this whole question of, of you know I think the question all of you are taking up in different ways and from different angles is the consequence of signalization and a move away, really critically from all the strategies of delineation that have traditionally structured how we talk about what architecture is trying to do and how it accomplishes its ends by connecting, connecting lines and creating planes amongst them. Now, early on in one of the presentations you said, we're generating these data sets in order to create surfaces. And, and I actually don't think in most cases, I think if you ended up at surfaces, you might have found yourself down a cul-de-sac. I actually don't think surfaces were, were, were what you were after. I actually, as compelling as the facade studies in your project are, I actually think those are a, those are a faint for you. I think, mm -hmm. they're, I think they're more interesting consequences to, to your project. And I want to just end with, 
the uh, project, Marcelin and I both have been looking at the, the project that studied translucency and tried to figure out why it has this odd rhyme for us both with Mies van der early tower studies for Friedrichstrasse. And I, I, I couldn't be a higher compliment, but it's a complicated one for me. It's, it's almost like that Miesian logic with a kind of autistic turn. Mm -hmm. That, that exactly the degree to which those crystalline towers announce the possibility of pure linearity and plane in architecture, you guys seem to be on the threshold of a very different set of possibilities that almost eliminates those as points of departure for the work. And I think your project actually illustrates that in, a, in, a, in an interestingly brutal way. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the idea of, of what are the data sets that you're in, including into the algorithm. And I think that the strength of the work is precisely comes from the fact that you're not actually adding all of them, right? If you would actually have a much more robust neural network, you would actually use them as, as they're being used out there as a prediction machine, as a time machine trying to anticipate the production of value or meaning in culture, right? Uh, there's this kind of interesting anecdote that we discussed with Casey about how uh, artificial intelligence has been used for predicting what, a, what pop song would actually be a hit versus one that wouldn't, right? So that you would actually, in a way, anticipate you know, what would actually create money and would resonate with audiences. But that doesn't mean that there's songs that can fail the test and the scoring of that test and that would perform really good with cultures that would actually rise thousands of dollars or create kind of audiences as well. That means that the, kind of the, the prediction machine is actually trying to chase a moving target. And this is where you're bringing AI with, with that kind of optimism, I guess, um, to suggest that it will never kind of achieve a perfection or a kind of a positivism of, of achieving a, a prediction machine, but rather one that it's constantly being tweaked and turned in relation or in correlation of, of what you're bringing in as well as an architect, right? Like the, the production of value, it's a kind of a, a loop between what you're putting out there and how it's being responded. So I think that the process of the CD and the process of architecture should, for now, and I think that this is what you're doing, it's, it's strong as an augmentation. And in that regard, I think that the word hallucination is it's quite uh, relevant and because it's really expanding your, your capacity to establish correlations and, and value systems in, in, into the architectural proposition, as opposed to saying this is the objective performative kind of criteria that would actually work. And I, I was happy not to hear that kind of tone on, on the presentation. So I think that's pretty strong. Yeah, not, not an architect, artist, person over here. My name is Lars. Um, first, just, yeah, as a, as a generative lab, it's really exciting just to see you use these sets of tools. And I don't, I'm not particularly familiar with the tools, but there's this, I, I, I want to take the idea of the TED Talk also as not incidental in relationship to AI in the sense of um, an algorithm related to thinking and sequencing of thoughts and, um, and the idea of averages. What it, what it, I don't know how the neural networks precisely work, but sometimes it seems to me that when, there are, when complexity is generated and, there, and complexity is nudged in various directions, they, can, it, they actually tend to kind of converge in, in interesting ways. And I don't know if that's the nature of the algorithm itself and how much um, weight you can shift in your interpretation or application of the neural network. But I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've seen processing, right, as a kind of program, like the sort of visualizing of data language, right? Um, have you seen, are you familiar with processing as a way of expressing data generally? That's like a kind of, I find that like you, you can see processing at work and that it creates a sort of average visual experience. And so it carries its own biases with it. And I, want, and, and I, I wonder, as a platform in terms of a next step, my question is, what are the limitations of generating material this way for you? How could you use a different process to expand on any one of these ideas um, and take it to a place that actually approaches the averages of the, either the TED Talk or the average, the average um, of the technology or at least the synthesis of the data as it's currently modeled um, into a different place? Like what U-turn would you take? Or what parachute, or what plane would you jump out of, and what parachute would you use? Like what? That's yeah. Do you guys have any answer to that? Uh. <laughs> or anyone wants to take this on? I don't have an answer to that, but I have like a, another comment. I think I mean every tool you use always has its inherent biases, right? So it's like and it has its inherent its own aesthetics. So I think that's not a problem you can really 
escape. So if you use processing, it's going to you know, have its own bytes. It's going to look like processing. If you model in this in this software, it's going to look like you modeled it in that software. And I think, I mean, this is a problem that we've encountered for forever. <laughs> um, so I don't think that's something that I can, I can just start. Can, yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, I have some questions about processing. Because someone mentioned processing. Um, so, you know, what I think is the, oh, yeah. What I think is the difference between this kind of approach and the traditional uh, algorithmic approach is that uh, in the traditional one, we know what's going to happen once we start coding something, right? And I think here we have a, a bit of a conundrum happening because we are kind of, uh, you know, kind of deploying things into the world that we have no actual kind of overview of, right? And I think as an as a authorial uh, uh, kind of agenda, I think it's interesting to think about the difference between uh, the traditional mode of production of architecture, which is kind of predicated on this idea of overview of the process and uh, the relationship of the process and the model and the relationship of the model with the so-called real and the new landscape that is now kind of happening in this amazing work, which is where we don't actually know anymore what kind of... Uh, uh, relationship there is, or is there any kind of relationship beyond kind of uh, fascination or, or let's say the, the awe of the so-called designer or, I mean, would you describe yourselves as designers in a traditional sense or would you think that there is something new to be said about the role that you have as, as, uh, as authors? So what would be the moment of authorship here if the traditional moment is kind of spent and, and uh, not there anymore, right? I, I think where uh, the authorship lied in using the AI algorithms, I mean, specifically for me, was like Sam mentioned, uh, when you build up the library, I think it, it touches a bit onto what you were saying. That's where you really have the agency on controlling the outcome. Yes, the AI has a certain aesthetic, but you can tweak it uh, enough with the libraries to try to guide it in a way where you can lead it to a, an aesthetic that you would kind of desire. But do you think that it's more interesting to work with non-visual uh, kind of problems in AI? Because what I just kind of assume at this point is that if we kind of stay within the traditional model mm -hmm. of, of uh, authorship, I think then the, we, we will be kind of selecting from what is given to us, right? Yeah. But is, do you think that there is a way to work with this kind of material that is like non-visual, or let's say if it if it if it has that potential, then maybe what is produced is going to be even more weird in the end. Because you know that might be the the actual point to sure. to get into. I mean, it's hard to respond to that because uh, those are not. I mean, I don't want to say that this, those are not the tools that we've learned, but kind of a little bit. This, we were presented with these sets of algorithms and we were trying to control the outcome of that sort of tool rather than trying to explore if another tool could Just be better. Also, to come back to processing, this is not a traditional algorithm that you're using. This is right. a, a, a return to something we can call a black box mm -hmm. uh, conceptually. And it means that it's kind of... And at this time, it's not an expert problem anymore. So before a black box, black box was an expert problem. You would find someone who knows, and then they tell you what it is, right? This one is a non-expert problem. Like, even the people that make these things have no real knowledge of what happens right. inside, right? And I think this is an interesting shift from the traditional authorship model that is about kind of having a, a complete insight into the, the working of a system, and then kind of, you know, um, uh, you know having a, a kind of a, a responsibility to what happens with the output, mm. and this one where we can go back to some kind of uh, interpretation model, which is maybe pre-scientific, and maybe that's exciting too, you know? You know, I mean, in a, in a way, I think the authorship question <clears throat> to me is tied to the ethics question much more than necessarily the, let's say, economy of the, every pixel needs its matter question. Although I think it's really, it's a curveball you threw, right? But with the sort of ethics question, it was interested, interesting to see that nobody at all wanted to take that on on this side of the table because that's kind of like you should 
You should react to that one, one way or another. But I think, I mean, to me, the, the, the interesting part of the ethic question with this kind of work is somewhat tied to the notion of the loss of authorship and the sort of, you know, all the debate about post-humanism that's been going on for some time now, but also reaches back to modern art, like particularly the second half of the 20th century where people started to feel already very uncomfortable with the idea of the author. So it's not just, that's not just a technology related, um, it's, it's much more of a cultural idea. But of course it gets a, a very different um, acceleration to, um, to the level where you guys are dealing with technology. And I think um, um, I was wondering that when I'm recognizing the hand of the offer or a partial hand of the offer is on an ethical level, is there something that is different, right? I mean, is this sort of equation that we all assume to be true that um, the more control you have about your work, um, that there's also kind of a you know, kind of a flip side to that. Um, while when we begin to sort of liberally, uh, let's say, distribute authorships, not only uh, in teams, but through different kinds of media, let's say technological, human, different kinds of agencies, and we mix them all up, well, um, clearly there's a new aesthetic that's emerging, but, but is there also, let's say, a different kind of ethic um, that brings us away from, let's say, the enlightenment paradigm and towards a new kind of architectural reality. I think it, it, that, that's, to me, an underlying big question that we're all somehow grappling with these days, and I think your projects um, touch on this question. So it's maybe something else to also, on your part, to contemplate and, and you know, form an opinion about. I never realized until today that I want to hear a debate between Ferda and Michael on the idea of ethics. <laughs> but I, I, would, I would show up for that one. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I think if one of you is being extremely ethical. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about a lot of the comments that we're making and a lot of the questions of, uh, of authorship and, uh, and originality that we're dealing with here are just about the AI stuff. But I feel like a huge problem starts to come up for the AI when the AR comes into the game, that this ends up being an AR studio that was populated with AI stuff to make it look cool, but actually got kind of a little trampled by AR's uh, fundamental problem for architecture, right? Architecture is always virtual reality until someone pays you to build a piece of it and then you get to just do reality. But we never do that kind of augmentation. And the augmentation problem and why architecture has never done great work in AR yet, I think, is because uh, not having to translate between the virtual and the real, allow, getting to have both at the same time just prioritizes the kind of aesthetics of the tool and not the aesthetics of the object itself. And I think that that becomes a pitfall here, that it's easy, as long as you can kind of keep the AI enclosed in, a, in, a, in an augmentation. If it lives, and whether that augmentation is for the effect of the user or a tool for the creation of the project, it doesn't matter because uh, the AI is kind of made safe because it's been quarantined into, into it, the territory that, that lives in between the virtual and the real and therefore it never has to kind of become problematic in the way that architecture usually does. I don't know, did you guys feel like the augmentation was useful to make your projects uh, really pull forward or do you feel like it was, there was a problem, I mean as, as I, I'm trying to say I felt, between the, the AI part and the augmentation part. I think this is a lingering question, which I think is super important, and I often ask you guys, you know, the question of authorship, the question of, well, this is a different question a little bit about that, which to me raises not only the sort of ethical issues about like also, uh, or the aesthetic of authorship, but like if you could just like make it all go away, it's probably easier to just choose, you know, like this style and that style, whereas like, you know, when you actually make something physical, it's just a different condition. So anyway, I know uh, Michael needs to take it on, but... Th this last comment was great. I want to hear somebody take it on. I think your your project answers that answers that quandary the most convincingly. I think you were getting 
I think you were getting the imagery and the and the data set to play off one another in a pretty compelling way. And actually, it's you know, design authorship in the conventional sense is actually rather limited in your scheme in the sense that you recreated this device of state of you know of, of variable staging, mm -hmm. and then started to exploit its possibilities and augment augment how it works. But watching it spin through here, what you've developed is a system that begins to generate, I mean, it looks like an animation of, Goya, of Goya's, of, you know, of, of, uh, you know, of you know, Goya's pandemonium or something. I and mean, it's a remarkable effect that's generated in that, you know, in that, in that play. And I think it's interesting to me where, where those of you that did turn to, turn to the image sets and mapping and I think, I, I feel like where they became useful is as tests more than as generative mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I feel like in, in your case, I think they actually took the possibilities of your, of your work and, and heightened them in a way that was really unforeseeable. That's where it became kind of, that's where actually it became fruitfully de-authored, I think, in a remarkable way. But I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hand the microphone this way. You're kidding. <laughs> I, well, <coughs> wow, I've been drinking too much Red Bull. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, boy, uh, I think uh, what you've done is quite extraordinary. And I think the accomplishment in very short order, I don't know how long the class lasted, but it was really, I think the result is extraordinary. And I congratulate all of you and also Marcelo and Casey and so on. I actually have a very dear friend who won a Nobel Prize and we're neighbors. His name is David Baltimore. And every time I see him or often when I see him, we get into this discussion about I know what research is in science. I know what peer research is. I know what other kinds of research are. But what the hell, Richard, is research in architecture and design? And it's been a subject, I think, that architecture has ignored for a very long period of time. And I've been involved in projects like LA Now with Tom Main. Uh, we worked with Frank Gehry to create a design research center uh, that had a digital library connected to digital studios that would create a whole different environment for a school of design. And I think we're, if somebody asked me what you're doing, uh, I would say that the future might be unknowable, but it's not unthinkable. And you're thinking about the future. And I think creative people like yourselves are actually the alchemists of the future. And I think you're not just thinking, we, Marcelo and I talked about the music center. And I think you're not just talking about the music center you're talking about a much larger context. You're talking about the urban context that surrounds it, the city of Los Angeles, the whole thing. And I think that this is the kind of project, and this, the credit here goes to Hernan, to Marcelo, to Casey, and to you for leading this sort of initiative into research uh, that hasn't been done before. And it's gonna bring in technology like AI, it's gonna bring in other kinds of technology. But I think if I showed these projects to the board of the Music Center, which I am thinking of doing, uh, because they're doing a little, exp I was involved in Disney Hall. I chaired the architecture committee that picked Frank Carey, and I worked on that project for 18 years to get Disney Hall built. And I feel that the old Music Center is the next major project probably the most important cultural project in Los Angeles for the future. What they're doing now is remodeling the plaza. That's not enough in our world. And you showed that here. And I would like to show them these projects because I think we'd scare the shit out of them. And, and I think this is what's so important for what happens in a school like SciArc, is that you take these kind of risks, you do this kind of experimentation, and you make research as important as the final design and that it will lead to a better and more comprehensive and more compelling design in the end. Uh, I wasn't prepared to speak, so I'm not anxious to do this, but I say congratulations very, 
for what you've done. And your futures are going to be much more interesting uh, than you can possibly imagine. I think schools like SciArc have the responsibility to educate students for jobs that don't exist, for occupations that don't exist, and to redefine what the word architect means. And you're in the right place at SciArc. So congratulations. <laughs> no, no, look, look, that, that's such an amazing final comment that you kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm obviously not Marcelo Casey, but I kind of just think that, hey, Thank you. that's fantastic. Well said. Completely agree. Well, thank you, everyone. Part of this is also that there'll be enough time for you guys to sort of mingle, meet, talk to these guys, and just do the social part, which we cherish so much here. Unless our uh, fearless leader wants to say something, uh, you know, I give you the last word. I think we should quit when we are ahead. Exactly, exactly. I think Good. The fire yeah. Uh, With those words of wisdom. No, I, I think the more that you stretch, exactly. I think the risk to start to talk about the problems of the project. Sure. Uh, this, is, this is a good thing when you have so many critics. Nobody gets to get to the say the bad thing. One, one, the only two or three, it's OK. I think everybody can hear me without microphone. It's all the, it's, it's the people in around the world that are listening right now, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. I, always, <laughs> already not, I have enough friends in my life. I don't need more. Um, <laughs> Yeah, two, two things I, I just want to comment, which I think you, you keep resurfacing, resurfacing in, in, many, in, many, in many of the arguments. And I was fascinated and puzzled why everybody's so obsessed with this problem of authorship. Uh, I still find it interesting after 25, 30 years of the conversation about whatever evolution of tools and whatever version we are. Uh, I really find interesting Damien talking about tradition of coding, like now it's an historical it's an historical thing now. There's a kind of a traditional way to do coding and an innovative one, uh, which is really telling about the speed of transformation in the thing. So I, the, the only thing I will say is, is, is in relation to the authorship is I, I find it interesting that we keep discussing that instead to try to, re to, in try to accept that one way or another any creative process will claim a form of authorship. And I think, I, I really don't think it's, I, I don't think it's a valid, no, valid is the wrong word. I don't think it's the right discussion anymore. To me, it's much more about what are the values in which these new forms of authorship will be measured. And honestly, what are, let's say, the most quasi-pragmatic way to deploy these things, which I think, this is the other part which I, I, I will challenge the, this group of students who are graduating now, but I will challenge the faculty and, and David and everybody involved in EDGE to keep moving and thinking and to stop talking about these things that they are like abstract speculations and so on, and really try to understand them as another piece of the puzzle of realities. And, and I think this is, this is an exercise for us as critics, um, because for those of us who we were in the generation in the 90s when it seemed it, it seems like a, we keep going back to similar patterns of discussions that it seems to me like the, the subject matter change, but we, we, every time there's something else, we, that, that's, a, that's my, only, my only two points. I really think it's, and I think it's important for you guys that the way that you talk. There's still there's a level of comfort about this to operate in some kind of a research argument, which again, I will keep insisting this for a long time. I think we need to, we, need, we really talk, we need to talk more about speculation and less about research. Like these are viable ways to start to think about things and that's why I would encourage everybody how we can, and, and again, honestly, I don't have the answer for it. But I just, I, I, I'm fascinated by this notion about the authorship because to me, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a relevant point anymore. I really, I, I just think it's just another, another brick in the evolution of these things. And to me, to start to talk about the pragmatics of this and the deployment of this and what are the mechanisms of deployment, it starts to become a much more urgent matter than anything else. Uh, and I, and, and I, but honestly, I, I, that is more a, a question to you guys than us, the critics. 
Uh, I think it's, it's, I think it's uh, we need to get, you guys need to get out of the comfort to use the shield of, like this is kind of a, an abstract, unparalleled research thing that doesn't, it's still yet to come. I really think it's already part of what we are, and I, and I really, I really, I really hope that we're getting into that phase in which that conversation became much more like a, it's much more like a common knowledge right now. And so it should be much more about specific about those things. But uh, in any case, I think the work is pretty remarkable, and I think that it's, the conversation was pretty remarkable. And anyway, I, I was planning to stay quiet, but. Uh, because I think Richard, Richard Koshalik being the smart guy than he is, I think he summarized better than any, any of us will do. That's why he's way more successful than all of us combined. <laughs> yeah. um, not a final word, but I uh, probably should have brought this up a little earlier. Uh, the, uh, you all remember when we were reading uh, the Heidegger, right, in the seminar? And we're talking about how technology allows us to substitute. So like uh, human labor can be substituted by robot labor. Robot labor can get substituted by virtualized labor with no machine either, et cetera, right? But it's technology that produces a, a framework, an intellectual framework, where things can get substituted, right? So. Uh, what occurred to me watching this was uh, there's a, a, a slightly different kind of narrative, I think, coming out about uh, virtual reality and AI and things like that, which I find kind of exciting about what you've done this past year. So already in the 90s when the first goggles were you know, invented and people were playing with it and you heard theories, oh, we don't need buildings anymore because people just put on goggles, right? This will substitute that, right? It didn't turn out to be the case, you know? And then meanwhile, uh, the uh, architectural historians in the 90s were pointing out, well, you know, there's this funny chapter in The Hunchback of Notre Dame where Victor Hugo saying, all right, the printing press is gonna replace architecture, right? Because the facade of the church was kind of functioning in that way. So now that we have mass printing, oh, we don't need uh, the facade anymore. Didn't turn out to be true, right? So this idea of uh, the virtual performance or the virtual facade somehow replacing the physical facade, uh, that's, I think, the cliche common narrative we have about these things, right? And it turns out to be the wrong conversation, I think. Because uh, obviously you do still have the physical facade, like in Maxime's uh, fritted uh, panel that receives the new images, right? Uh, it's not that it, there's, it no longer has images, it's just two images now. Like the image of the fritting and the image that's grafted onto it. So nothing's getting substituted by anything. It's just that the whole idea of what's, what physical means is undergoing some evolution, you know, so uh, I'm with uh, Hernan on uh, trying to take a kind of uh, pragmatic ethic to this, like, uh, all right, so now what do we do with this? Because it clarifies a lot, I think. A lot of the intellectual problems get clarified by the range of what's possible, you know? So uh, I think uh, the work is opening up some of these new territories of what it might mean to be physical. I don't think architecture is going anywhere. You know, it's not getting replaced by anything. It's just changing. I think. Okay, so uh, I think I just wanted. You know, this is an important question. I think one that actually has been sort of lingering around, and I think Hernan brought up the other one. Um, I really want to thank all of you. Uh, I want to thank the students for doing an amazing work. I also want to acknowledge Kurime Batliner, who's sitting all the way at the end, who's helped us a lot from the robot house and the facilitator to many of these sort of technological things. And my co-keeper, uh, uh, Casey, here. 
and, and everyone at CIARC. Uh, I also want to help, I mean, everyone in the jury who come and sit down through this sort of long thing, maybe to not say maybe enough, uh, especially the non-architects who maybe made even more of a sacrifice to sort of expose themselves <laughs> to these kind of uh, uh, conditions. I sort of welcome that and I want to kind of keep embracing that because I think it's important for us to, you know, for you guys to kind of really take a sort of entrepreneurial approach to, to, to architecture and to these kinds of problems of technology in general. Uh, besides that, you know, I'd like to kind of encourage you guys to mingle. This is one of the things I learned from Bob Stern. And <laughs> just really go meet these people and talk and show them their work. And again, thank you guys for putting all the time and effort, okay?